Well, hello. How are you? Hope everyone is well. Tonight we are opening the 2022 season of the Literary Cocktail Hour with Pulitzer Prize winning author Stephen Nafay and his new book, Van Gogh and the Artist He Loved, with art historian Stephen Mack. Between November of 1881 and July of 1890, Vincent Van Gogh painted almost 900 paintings. Since his death, he has become one of the most famous painters in the world. Van Gogh's paintings are utterly unique and they are in vivid palettes and boldly interpretive portraits that are unmistakable. Yet his revolutionary, however revolutionary his style may have been, it was actually built on a strong foundation of paintings by other artists. Now drawing on Van Gogh's own thoughtful and profound comments about the painters he venerated, Pulitzer Prize winning author Stephen Nafe gives a ripping account Van Gogh's deep engagement with his work. Van Gogh's most prolific years were spent in Provence, so I am drinking a very nice French rosé, although I did consider absinthe. What is everybody else drinking? Perfect. Lots of wine drinkers out there, if you can join me. <laughs> Stephen Nafe is an artist and an award-winning author, a graduate of Harvard Law School. He has written for art periodicals and has lectured at numerous museums, including the National Gallery of Art. He studied art history at Princeton, and he completed his graduate work at the Fogg Art Museum of Harvard University. He has written books, many books on art and other subjects, including four New York Times bestsellers, his biography, Jackson Pollock, an American Saga, written with Gregory White Smith, won the Pulitzer Prize and was a finalist for the National Book Award. It also inspired the award-winning film in 2000, Pollock, featuring Ed Harris and Marsha Gay Hart, as well as John Updike's novel, Seek My Face. His recent work, Van Gogh, The Life, also written with Smith, was praised as the definitive work on the artist by the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. And his new book, Van Gogh and the Artist He Loves, was released in November. Stephen Mack holds a PhD in art history from Rutgers University. His dissertation, Before Non, non Finito, a rough, rough aesthetic in Quattrocento sculpture from Donatello to Michelangelo. For more than eight years, he was a researcher for Yves Tong. Yves Tong G um, catalog resume under the preparation of Pierre and Tana Matisse Foundation. Steve lives in New York City. Please join me in welcoming um, Steve and Steve, <laughs> Steve and Steven. The uh, question and answer is open for your questions. You can ask or upvote your favorite, and the chat window is open for your comments. Well, thank you very much. And, and before we start, I, I'd like to thank Sandy and Jerry and Brian Mooney, who have all um, really helped to put this together. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you for, for coming. And I hope you're safe and healthy. And if you so wish that you're joining us with you know, some favorite beverage in hand. Few artists in the world are as beloved as Vincent van Gogh, and few people have spent as much time with van Gogh as Stephen Nafee. The biography is fantastically detailed and beautifully written. It's a page turner that's neither sensationalist nor mythologizing, painting a loving but unflinching portrait of a brilliant artist who is also a profoundly alienating, tortured man. The new book shows van Gogh alongside some of his key inspirations, giving readers a chance to see the art with fresh eyes. The lonely genius we all know so well is in this book, but so is an artist deeply engaged with his own world. We learned that Van Gogh was a prolific reader, an avid collector of prints, and a keen observer of art with a powerful memory for images. So Steve, how did you decide to write this book? And what do you think the artists who most influenced Van Gogh tell us about him? Well, in a biography, there's only, um... Uh, especially one that's almost a thousand pages long, uh, and you're only given a certain number of pages in color, and you have to fill it with as many images, basically two to a page, as possible. So uh, we always felt 
that we weren't really doing uh, justice to the paintings uh, in the book. And um, um, it, 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 there are there have been a couple of, of books on the subject of, uh, of Van Gogh and the artists who influenced him. The Van Gogh Museum did a really important exhibition some time ago, but because they were focused on, on what would be in the exhibition, they really couldn't cover the whole subject the way it deserved to be covered. And uh, so I had any painting in the world that I could get the museum to give me rights to. Uh, and um, uh, Random House, which published the book, managed to uh, produce a, uh, at a reasonable cost, a 448 page book on great paper with terrific uh, <laughs> um, color and, and quality of, of uh, reproduction. So it was a thrill to look at the, yeah, there it is. <laughs> it's a, uh, um, uh, and it gave me an opportunity to look very specifically at, you know, the biography as you, you're, thank you very much for your very kind comments about it, uh, which are also elegantly stated, I may add. Um, but, the, you know, we have to cover everything and, and there's, you have to sort of have, the life has to unfold and therefore no one specific topic becomes um, the, the focus of the reader's attention for, for very long because life isn't, uh, a series of, of discrete uh, intellectual observations or interests on the, you know, it's, it's, it's a combination of life unfolding as it does, uh, interests that, that um, stack one on top of the other. And uh, so it was really exciting to be able to focus on this one issue, which was, you know, which artists did Van Gogh love? Which uh, paintings among those artists' work did he love? And and, and, and how did it work its way into his own paintings? Mm -hmm. And um, um, uh, it, it's, as, as, uh, as was said, because he's such an original painter, because, and he seemed even more original back then uh, than he does now when so much art, the German expressionists and the like have learned from him. And we sort of, it doesn't look quite as revolutionary now as it did in 1890 even, uh, but, it um, I, it still looks pretty shocking. So it's I think it's a revelation to some people that that he was so completely involved in the art of his predecessors. You know, he really he was an incredible intellectual for all of his mental problems and for all of his loneliness and for all of his lack of of you know he had a very hard time in school. He flunked out of several institutions, uh, but he was an incredible intellectual and sort of self taught, and he spoke four languages, read voluminously. He read in, in English, French, Dutch, and German. Uh, he could, he had memorized whole swaths of, of poetry, both uh, American and English and Dutch and German and French. I mean, he had favorites in all those languages and he knew the art that came before him. He, um, you know, he, had, a, he had a photographic memory so at a time when they didn't have art books and there wasn't an internet to turn to, um, and it was very hard to get a, a, a reproduction other than a sort of small black uh, print uh, based on a painting. Uh, it was hugely helpful to him that he had been in a lot of major cities and had gone to a lot of museums and had an intense uh, detailed memory of those paintings the rest of his life. So when he was, of creating a new painting, he had all of those sources, the literary sources, the, the lifetime sources, uh, you know, issues in his own life that reverberated through the new painting. And of course, all these great images by all these artists he loved. It was mostly Western, although he, he himself collected both English engravings and Japanese prints. So Japanese prints were terribly important to him, but he really knew uh, Western art from the Renaissance through uh, his lifetime, uh, heavily focused on the art of his own era, which was the entire 19th century. Um, I could go right. on, but I think uh, <laughs> you may have another question. Well, no, I mean, and, and you um, actually touched upon where, where I was going with my next question in that, um, you know, this book lets us immerse into Van Gogh's visual culture. And you can see where he's coming from. And through that, um, you can see how unique and original and powerful his work is. So I, I was quite surprised in the introduction to read that Van Gogh did not see himself as a revolutionary artist. 
No, and no, that, he, yeah, and he that saw himself uh, as a preserver of tradition. <laughs> yeah. So, could you talk a little more about how how he saw himself in the history of art and and where he thought his um, what he thought his influence was going to be? Well, uh, it, it's 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 a fascinating thing because we now we now see him through a hundred plus years of history and this vast reputation that he has, you know, the fact that he's the most beloved artist in the world. And I think that's a pretty, all you have to do is look at the number of immersive experiences devoted to him <laughs> and how many devoted to anybody else. And it's uh, an indication of where he, uh, where he is. He, um, he was, because there was so little appreciation for his work during his lifetime, uh, you know, one painting sold basically, um, even though he was desperate to sell, and uh, even his even his brother Theo, who supported him, who made his life possible, who was his only financial and emotional support, wasn't really so, wasn't really convinced that Van Gogh was doing something important until the very end of his life, after a couple of critics and a couple of artists said some very positive things about it. But those were said in the last um, like seven eight months of, of Van Gogh's life. So until those seven months, uh, he all he knew was that he was a failed artist. I mean, nobody seemed to take any interest. People sort of laughed at the art. Um, his, even his own brother had a hard time um, showing enthusiasm. Uh, and then, then this uh, there's a, a symbolist poet who's in his twenties who writes an article about Van Gogh, uh, saying that he's the greatest artist in the world. <laughs> It's a little <laughs> bit like Clement Greenberg in uh, like 1951, I think it was, in Life magazine, claiming that Jackson Pollock was the greatest living painter. Well, Pollock already had a pretty good sense of himself by the time that Greenberg <laughs> said that, but it was a shock to the world that you had this important critic saying this. Um, that Greenberg had a tie to Vermont, as you may know, because uh, Helen Frankenthaler was going to Bennington. Right. Um, uh, Van, uh, so Van Gogh... Uh, then, then there's an exhibition, a couple of exhibitions, including one in, uh, in uh, uh, Brussels, where some artists, including Claude Monet um, and Toulouse-Lautrec, who knew Van Gogh, and uh, Theo van Rijsselberg, the greatest Belgian artist of the period, say that of all these paintings, the, perhaps the most interesting things are these works by this unknown Dutchman, uh, Vincent van Gogh. Uh, but van Gogh never really was able to assimilate that sense that he was uh, emerging. So he thought, he actually addressed this. One of the wonderful things about Van Gogh is because of the letters, we don't really have to guess a whole lot. Mm. You know, with, with, Van, with Pollock even, even though he's much more recent, you know, he didn't leave any written records basically and he was, didn't talk a lot. So it was sort of, we had to guess a lot uh, based on as much information as you could uh, develop. With Van Gogh, he wrote all these things. So we have the actual sentences about specific paintings. And we have sentences about where he saw himself in the history of art, which is he saw himself as a kind of intermediate figure. Uh, he saw himself as somebody who would help lead towards more important art someday. And he, he was a, 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 a link in the chain, to use the, uh, his own uh, hmm. metaphor. Uh, so we now, of course, see him as a whole lot more than that. We don't see him as simply some sort of bridge between traditional 19th century painting on the one hand and say the German expressionists on the other. You know, he's this unique and massively important artist who, you know, would have, would, would be hugely important if no one else had learned from his art, which of course they did. So um, I think it's, uh, I think I, I, one thing you said uh, before that question was that um, uh, in a way looking at his paintings and one of the things that was, I was able to, to do in the book was to have side-by-side -side comparisons, a lot of them, uh, is on the one hand, they, sh they, they, they show where he drew his inspiration and how much he loved, because the, the statements below, uh, below each painting show how uh, just uh, affectionate he was, you know, profoundly uh, passionate as well about the art of his predecessors. Uh, and you can see those influences but you also see where he took it and how how much more radical he was than I think he thought he was himself. You know, mm. he, he didn't. You know, we, if as as shocking as the paintings, they actually don't look shocking anymore. We, he's too well known 
for these paintings to look shocking. But if you imagine a painting like the, say the sunflowers with all that bright yellow and the colors in some cases were brighter back then than they are today. Some of the uh, uh, reds have, have dulled over time and some of the other colors have been affected. Um, you know, compared to what Cezanne was doing, or even Manet was doing, if you think about what the other artists were doing when Van Gogh came along, uh, the palette was just in, incredibly bright. Uh, it, it, uh, and and the, the drawing was, uh, Greg and I, my co-author and partner, uh, thought that there was a parallel between Jackson Pollock and many parallels actually between Pollock and Van Gogh. And one of them was that neither one of them had the capacity, had the talent for traditional drawing. Hmm. You know, uh, Pollock at the Art Students League was one of the least talented draftsmen by traditional standards of any student in the in the class. Um, and Van Gogh was literally the last, the, the bottom student in his class in Antwerp and couldn't really draw the human form with technical accuracy the way the standard artist was learned how to do it. So what both of those artists had to do was create a whole different kind of draftsmanship, Pollock with the drip technique and Van Gogh with this expressionistic uh, uh, drawing that sort of became a new form to which they were almost not quite uniquely, but they were specifically talented at. So they basically changed the rules of the game so that after them, it became, I shouldn't, maybe it's too far afield, but uh, Pollock had an older brother who was an artist, which is why he became an artist. He couldn't do uh, Jackson's kind of abstract art and it sort of really damaged his life because mm -hmm. he had been so effective as a traditional draftsman. And the same thing uh, with Van Gogh. Uh, after Van Gogh, you know, salon painting just seemed dull. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the great draftsmen, Bouguereau and Maisonnier and all the Jerome, these incredible talents who made very beautiful paintings and Van Gogh loved them intensely. It, it, that kind of painting became less and less relevant. And Van Gogh's uh, expressionistic, emotionally driven, uh, sort of more individual uh, um, kind of drawing became the sort of uh, standard for all of art. So they both played this pivotal figure. Right. Well, maybe that that's a good um, segue to talk about some um, artworks from your book, and and we've prepared a few um, a few images to to talk through. And I'll just share my screen. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, one of the questions is, that someone might reasonably have is, did Van Gogh have a favorite among all mm. these artists that he loved? And I think it's fair to say that his favorite. Um, he said it himself, uh, uh, and in terms of the number of art, of, of works of art that he copied, Jean-Francois Millet is by far the most important. And uh, uh, what he loved about him was two, two, two things. One is that Van, uh, Millet was a painter of peasants, and <clears throat> Van Gogh, like quite a few artists of his generation, thought it was the most interesting subject. Um, uh, because it was more authentic, uh, because it, uh, it uh, avoided the kind of um, uh, pleasantries of, of high style painting, uh, but also because it gave rise to emotional images like this wonderful uh, drawing by Millet, The First Steps of This Child, uh, which uh, could be um, cartoonish and, and uh, silly, except that Millet was such a great painter, he could take a subject, this Hallmark card-like, and turn it into something deep. Um, what Van Gogh does is, is to, as he, in fact, he said it, I like to take small black and white images, because this, he would have worked not from this uh, black chalk and pastel, he would have worked from a, a black and white image and to turn them into uh, these small black and white images into big colorful paintings. And this great work at the Met is a, um, is a terrific example. Yeah, and in, in fact, the, um, the comparison that's in, in the book is uh, Van Gogh's copy of this, which is in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, which has um, a grid on it that he, he drew himself. Yes, he, it, it, back then, 
although a lot of people watching today probably know this, but if you were trying to uh, enlarge a small drawing to a large uh, canvas, you would draw a grid and that would allow you to transfer the image more easily. And luckily the Van Gogh Museum still owns quite a few of the works, uh, the drawings and prints that he worked from. And, and many of them have the grids that show him trans, uh, how he transferred that image to a larger uh, canvas. All right, okay, next, next we prepared, oh, okay, one of uh, his copies of a Japanese print. Uh, well, I mentioned earlier that uh, he himself collected two kinds of things, English wood engravings from the uh, sort of popular magazines of the day um, and Japanese prints. Uh, uh, I think most people know that Japanese art had a huge influence on Western art uh, in exactly the time that Van Gogh was working. And uh, um, there was a, a store, there were many stores that sold Japanese things in Paris at the time, and literally dozens. Bing was the most important one, and Van Gogh would spend hours and hours at Bing's going through prints. A lot of them were very inexpensive, and they were not as great as these great, the, you know, the two most famous Japanese printmakers were Hiroshige, uh, who did this, and uh, work on the left, and, um, and Hokusai. Interestingly, Van Gogh couldn't afford those uh, works, and when he decided to make a copy, he chose the very best not the ones he could actually afford. And uh, he did three uh, enlarged copies of Japanese works. Um, and, but you can see, it is wonderful. You can, this is a great example, because you can see what he does. Not only does he intensify the color dramatically, uh, but he changes the proportions uh, somewhat. I mean, the, 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 stand, uh, the, the uh, foundation for the bridge is truncated in, in Van Gogh's drawing. The, um, uh, the brightness just changes it dramatically. Uh, and then of course he adds his border, this green border with this, with sort of Japanese like um, uh, characters that he pulled from different sources. Uh, and it makes for a very, a very different image than, than, yeah. than what he was drawing from, even though it is basically a copy of the Japanese print. Mm -hmm. And this one is, is another example of him um, moving in a very different direction from, from what's come before him. And, and this is an example where it's actually the same sitter um, about 20 years apart. Well, uh, Van Gogh actually knew this woman uh, who was a, ran a uh, cafe and who had been an artist model, which back then often meant more than modeling. And in fact, she had been the lover of, of uh, I, uh, it was definitely Corot and uh, Jerome and Manet, three of the biggest names in 19th century art. Uh, Van Gogh there, imp implied that he had an affair with her, but we don't think he did. It, it just, uh, um, she had a, a, a man who was sort of running her life and that cafe who would not have put up with Van Gogh for very long. And she, uh, but he did know her. And uh, because she had been um, the lover of those people, she was painted by, by Manet, she was painted by Jérôme, and she was painted twice by Corot. By Corot. The, uh, this is in the, in the Art Institute of Chicago. The other huge painting is at the National Gallery in Washington. What's interesting as we, as we see the shift from the incredibly subtle, nuanced, complete, uh, Corot to the incredibly riotously colored uh, Van Gogh is, is um, it's incredibly interesting that Van Gogh loved the Corot so much. The Corot <laughs> is one of his favorite artists for all of its quiet and, and uh, nuance and for all of the sort of, even though his own work was so very different, he found the work on the left uh, by Corot in, uh, incredibly beautiful. Corot was very important to him. And um, uh, um, so I think it's, 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 a, it's a really good example of how Van Gogh took on the whole portrait tradition because he loved, he wanted to do, make portraits more, more than anything else, which is sort of a, sh although he developed the capacity for it, uh, he's particularly strong at landscape 
and it's but he wanted to do portraits and he wanted to do them for a, rather a, a sad reason which was that he was so lonely that sitting in front of us uh, someone and painting their portrait uh, gave him some sort of um, a sense of being involved with other people uh, the, the, one of the best examples is Madame, but he just couldn't, he was so difficult and so unsocialized that he couldn't make these relationships with people to get people to sit for him. And sadly, the, the many, the, the multiple paintings of Madame Ginou that he painted, it was only when Van, when Gauguin comes to, comes to Arles and asks her to sit for him that Van Gogh has the opportunity to paint her. When he was simply asking for himself, he couldn't make it happen. So um, I think Agostina sat for this and for a couple of other paintings by Van Gogh. So they, they did know each other. And she also hung some of his paintings in her cafe, one of his first exhibitions. Uh, but they had a fight and she told him to get rid of them. And he came in with a wheelbarrow and had to <laughs> yank the paintings off the wall. Anyway, I, I think I've gotten yeah. uh, through Well, we just, we just have one more image that we prepared. Um, which is a painting that I believe Van Gogh was actually a bit critical of. Uh, well, he he had uh, um, um, he was he, he had a, a complicated relationship to Quentin, <laughs> and in the, in that uh, when, when he arrived in Paris, the Grand Jatte by Seurat was still the talk of the town. I mean, it was this huge, uh, not only a large painting, but it was. Uh, the, the the this it was what everybody was talking about and a, and a lot of artists including especially Signac whom Van Gogh got to know uh, became panelists and so Van Gogh who while he was in Paris he sort of tries everything he tries a little bit of everything including panelism mostly through his relationship with with Signac but Van Gogh would have known Lagrange Jatte extremely well the problem for Van Gogh was that he was so impatient that uh, the idea of, of a consistent panelist image, the one on the right is pretty close to as consistent as he could get, but you can see the blue of the, of the sky is not really panelist. And uh, the, the umbrella, uh, the red umbrella is not panelist. Uh, so it's sort of, and so most of his panelist paintings were some sort of mixture of panelism and, so, and something else. Um, but, uh, um, in the book, there are some sort of famous comparisons, uh, like the Japanese one, because it's obviously uh, you know crucial to seeing, and, and the and the copies after Mie, where Van Gogh was sort of using a subject matter to create a different image. It's not always known, um, but I I had not seen it in the literature that that the painting on the right was an emulation of of Seurat's painting, but it turns out that the other art historians have have known this connection for a long time. Well, I think we have a few questions from uh, the audience, which I can, okay. One of the questions is, what would you advise for someone who wants to write a biography? Where should one start? And, and this, she says, I actually would like to write fiction based on his biography, but I don't know if you have advice on something so specific. Well, the, the first task is figuring out who you're going to write about. <laughs> and it has a big impact on how big an audience you have, meaning there, um, the, the whole category of presidential biography is on a whole different level from, from art biography or literary biography. There are a lot of people in America who will only read presidential biographies. Uh, so the, the person you choose uh, does a lot to determine how big your audience is. I mean, uh, Van Gogh and and uh, um, and Pollock were both briefly bestsellers, um, but they were Pollock and Van Gogh. Uh, I'm not sure other artists, many other artists would would have that kind of potential audience. So the first, uh, the way Greg and I thought about it is 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 the following: um, How interesting is the person? Because you don't really want to be spending years writing a biography of somebody whose life was sort of tedious. And we considered Winslow Homer, for example, and because we love the art so much, but the life was sort of pleasant and not terribly interesting. Um, <laughs> and, um, but you also want the person to be intensely important. 
and you want the, uh, the life to be important to understanding their historical importance. You don't want, uh, uh, it's, it, it was important that in both the case of Pollock and Van Gogh, the difficulties in their lives, which were many, helped determine the kind of art they made. So there was a, 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 um, an intellectual justification for going through the life as carefully as we did. You also wanna make sure there's plenty of information because some people leave Van Gogh-like records and some people leave um, Pollock-like records. It would be very hard now to, to have done what we did for Pollock because we did it, I should tell, because uh, I, I bet many of the people watching today have read Robert Caro's uh, books on, on Johnson. And the Path to Power was the inspiration for our Van Gogh biography. It's a little odd because they were um, such different people. But uh, I was, and Greg, both of us were stunned by Robert Caro's meticulous research and his ability to reconstruct uh, Johnson's life from oral testimony. Uh, of course, he had plenty of written records too, but Paul, uh, Van uh, Pollock and and uh, uh, Johnson were born about the same time. So, and we were doing the book not that long after Carroll had started his work on on Johnson. And so, the pe people who knew Pollock were still alive. And I must say, uh, as exciting as it was to to find new, you know, to find things that people didn't know in in the records of somebody who died many years ago, it was incredibly exciting to be interviewed. We interviewed over 800 people for Pollock and, uh, um, and they were constantly telling us things that no one, they had never been put on paper. So it was, a, it was like uh, an archeological div, dig that produced something every day. So uh, as, you, um, as you contemplate this uh, biographical subject, you wanna make sure that there's plenty of information either in the, in the uh, re, uh, written record or um, if the subject is more recent in, uh, in, the, in, in oral interviews. Um, so those are the, um, I, I must say, uh, just the, the mechanics of it are, are complicated and, and maintaining control over the information is, is a complicated thing. Uh, I mean, I remember when we put together the, um, the outline for Pollock, which was, uh, I think, 250 single space pages, we're taking the cards we had made for Pollock and literally filling the whole apartment in New York, you know, taking every wall in order to distribute these cards. With Van Gogh, uh, we, we had some software engineers build a, um, a program that would allow us to do all that digitally. And uh, that allowed us to, to sort of, uh, control 100,000 note cards on, on Van Gogh. Um, so those are, those are the sort of issues I would think about. I, I can tell you it's extremely exciting because you get to know this family almost better than you get to know yourself, meaning the, su the subject and his or her family. Um, uh, I mean, I know Van Gogh's relatives <laughs> far better than I know my own. And in fact, it was quite touching when we went to uh, Amsterdam after the book came out, we had lunch with 11 of his uh, relatives and it was like meeting family. Uh, <laughs> and with, the, with Paul, like, you know, three of his uh, four brothers were still alive. The wives were all alive, alive. Lee was alive. So, you know, we sort of did get to know the family. And so uh, if you believe as Greg and I did that one of the great ways of understanding history is through a specific person, um, whether or not you believe in the great man theory of history, uh, it was, it's, um, it, it, it's, uh, to, to get to know someone that well is a very exciting, uh, venture. And I recommend it to anybody. Yeah. And, and the final chapter of, of the new book is about, um, your building your collection while also doing the research on, on, there go and and many of the illustrations in the book come from your collection. Could you talk about how collecting yeah, um, uh, was part of your process? Well, we, it became possible not because of the books, <laughs> especially Van Gogh and Pollock. You know, were not profit centers. <laughs> you know, they took ten years each, and you know, um, and were expensive to write. 
So they didn't pay for themselves. Luckily, uh, we had two businesses on the side that ranked lawyers and doctors, and which are still alive out there, although I no longer uh, am involved. And in fact, 30 million people have, I'm very proud of this, 30 million people have access to the doctor service we, we created all those years ago, which helps people find doctors for complicated, rare illnesses. Uh, I only mention all that because there wouldn't have been enough money to collect it all if we had not been busy on the side uh, running those businesses. In the early part of our career, we wrote books to, to pay the bills. We wrote some slightly sketchy books. And uh, so it's a very checkered list. Of, I see occasionally a list of what we've written and it's just all over the place. The, the real books and then these things that we wrote quickly um, to pay the bills. Luckily, the businesses supplanted all that, and we didn't have to write how-to manuals <laughs> going forward. Um, and so while we were doing uh, working on Van Gogh, we're sitting there reading his letters, reading about him, seeing which artists he loved. And a lot of those artists, you know, are Monet and uh, Corot and Millet that were well, well beyond our price range. But a lot of them were well within a, a reasonable price range. And so it was... Uh, it was it was incredibly exciting. It, it sort of made us feel because Van Gogh himself collected these things, either by exchange or Theo basically bought uh, multiple paintings by Guillaume, for example. And Greg and I were able to buy some paintings by Guillaume. So it 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 uh, enhanced the feeling of not identity because we were very different people, but the uh, the the uh, the the, um, the sort of sense of a common joy. In, mm -hmm. in admiring these paintings and wanting them as Van Gogh did and as we did and being able to live with them. It was, uh, and, and, and we bought them specifically because they related to Van Gogh. So one reason there are quite a few of them in the book is that we bought them, um, first his best personal friend was a guy named Van Rampard. And uh, he's now today only known as somebody who had been friendly with Van Gogh all those years ago. And he died quite young too, but he did a series of paintings of Rushman of, uh, from a, uh, an, uh, of, uh, an institute for blind people. And Van Gogh had written how much he loved uh, Rappard's uh, um, Rushman, uh, these, these blind Rushman. And we found a pr particularly beautiful example for very little money. And uh, so we were able to live with a painting that Van Gogh, even if he, whether or not he saw that specific painting, admired the entire group of them. So that that mm -hmm. was, it was one of the, um, uh, and, and also I should say we, uh, I loaned those paintings to two museums. In fact, there's a loan to the Columbus Museum of Art right now. And it gave the museums the opportunity to build a Van Gogh exhibition. One was in Columbia, South Carolina. Then the one, current one is in Columbus, South uh, uh, Ohio, where Greg was born or, or raised at least. And it, um, um, it allowed a small museum to, to, to start with like 60 or 70 paintings and build a Van Gogh show around them that might, would have been more difficult had they had to, to borrow everything. Sure. And one of the questions um, that we've gotten is, um, what have you learned about yourself as you research and write about Van Gogh? Um, gosh, what have I learned about myself? Um, well, I, uh, I think uh, the first thing that jumps to mind, <laughs> this may have to do with my age, um, is I've always thought that I was um, uh, um, I didn't give up easily. <laughs> meaning you don't run businesses without uh, overcoming a whole lot of challenges of every conceivable kind. And you don't write a book of this length uh, as, as Pollock or, or Van Gogh without getting up every day and working your way through the challenges. I mean, there were a couple of people who didn't want to speak to us for Pollock. And I wasn't going to say, let take no for an answer. And I worked and I worked and I worked. To, I mean, I, I think in the end, I'm trying to think of anybody even Elizabeth Pollock, Charles's first wife, who had become friendly with some other uh, Pollock biographer, was very difficult, but I even got her to talk to me. So he was constantly meeting the challenge. But compared to Van Gogh, I'm a biker. <laughs> you know, Van Gogh's challenges were so much more intense. I mean, just the, the loneliness, the, the, um, the financial problems, the guilt of, uh, for taking Theo's money, uh, 
the uh, the sense of of a constant failure, and yet he got up every morning and and worked and worked hard and kept on going even with no almost no uh, positive feedback. At least I've had some decent feedback over the years. Uh, so I I come away from it thinking, what what an extraordinary really uh, extraordinarily resilient person Van Gogh was, and therefore by comparison how. <laughs> I mean, I'm not that resilient. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they're, they're such great books and they're, they're so detailed and it must be, um, you know, both an incredible privilege and an incredible difficulty to be, um, to be working with an artist whose, whose life was such a, such a struggle. It was, it was, it, it, it got sad at times because you're, yeah. you're, you're in his head and that head is so challenging i mean the the the, the fear because he only had episodic psychotic episodes but he mm. knew that they existed and he was he was afraid all the time that a psychotic episode would come on you add that to the loneliness there are many days when the only person he spoke to was the waitress in the cafe that he ordered his lunch from and he felt that loneliness he was not really a loner he wanted to be around people and uh and he desperately wanted to be successful i mean part of the dutch um, um, culture, uh, including his own family, is that if you if you don't work hard and produce uh, uh, and become somewhat successful in your chosen life, you're, you're you're you know it's 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 a huge stain on your character. So for him not to prove himself uh, until the very end of his life was was uh, was difficult. So it was um, uh, it, it, it it was sometimes. Uh, um, you know, luckily we had each other, Greg and I did. And therefore at the end of the day, when we would talk about him, it wasn't just us and Vincent. It was, it was us with each other talking about Vincent. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, I must say to anyone, uh, uh, I, I've gotten to know Mark Stevens and Annalyn Swan, who were husband and wife and wrote their biographies of both de Kooning and Francis Bacon together as Greg and I did write our, the, our two major books together. It is a huge help to be working with someone else, because if you spent every, I, uh, even Robert Caro, his wife Ina, helps him with his books. So, you know, to be able to do the research or to work on the paragraphs every day, and then at the end of the day, to have someone who cares as much as you do about the product, uh, the project, and the product, and about the details, the incredibly, uh, uh, you know, for a huge amount of effort, not huge, but it's a substantial effort went into figuring out exactly what the first meeting between Lee Krasner and Jackson's mother, which was a momentous occasion. And we found out that she, the mother was wearing a blue dress. It's not important, but it added a little bit of color, so to speak, to the description of their uh, dinner. And we also knew exactly what they were eating and what uh, uh, Lee said, uh, what the mother said. How many people, I mean, even, the, even the people who are interested in reading the paragraph in the context of the whole life, they're not going to spend 20, 30 minutes discussing the, the you know, the, the, the dinner menu <laughs> at, uh, at, uh, at the Pollock uh, uh, Krasner uh, apartment. So to have someone who's that involved in, in the pro project with you, and also I may say, because he's gone, he died of, he had a, a brain tumor since I first met him, Greg did. And he went through 13 brain operations. He often wrote Van Gogh and Pollock from a hospital bed. Uh, um, and, um, and so I, I think I'm, I can say this, you know, the writing in, in, the, in the two biographies is just unbelievable. And Greg trained himself on both uh, Shakespeare and the Bible and Melville. So he had the best examples possible. And I think the prose is really... Um, stunning, and uh, um, I mean, I can read the books again. These, you know, now having read them dozens of times in the preparation process, and still be wowed by the way Greg works with language. And so, I encourage that to anyone out there. Yeah, we we've gotten a question about um, your your comments about the traveling Van Gogh experiences and immersive Van Gogh. Mm -hmm. um, exhibitions what what do you think of those have you been to some of well them? it's 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 complicated 
the the outpouring of interest is staggering. I mean, there are so many of these exhibitions throughout the United States, and in some cities, both Boston and uh, New York, and maybe one or two others, there were two competing ones going on at the same time. I just read yesterday that Augusta, Georgia, which is nearby and is not a particularly large town, has one coming to Augusta, as if the one in Atlanta and the one in Charlotte were not sufficient. So on the one hand, you know, uh, um, you know how wonderful for Van Gogh that people care this much. The problem is those audiences are not by and large, wanting to go see a real Van Gogh painting after having been to the immersive experience. And if it, if it created a larger audience for Van Gogh, which it is, I'm sure, to some extent, it's not creating a much larger audience mm. uh, for the actual paintings. And you know, uh, the, the immersive experience is one thing. The paintings are something very different. You know, the intimacy of them, the, the brushwork, you know, the, the joys of Van Gogh are not just in the sort of um, uh, gestalt of the image as blown up wall size um, or brought to life by having the crows cross the wheat field in real time. Um, so I, I've, I've mixed opinions about it. I mean, it's it, in and of itself, it's fine. To mm -hmm. the extent that replaces the art experience. And we live in an era when fewer and fewer people are interested in going to museums and looking at real art. So I, I don't think we can be entirely happy with it. I've, I've thought about what, what Van Gogh would have thought about it. And uh -huh. the fact is there were these uh, dioramas. There's one at the Met uh, that people may have seen about the, the Palace of Versailles. They were very popular in the 19th century because for people who couldn't travel, they could go into a room that had, you know, was, it, where they were surrounded by a painting and could sort of imagine what it would be like to be standing in the, in the um, uh, outside of the, uh, Versailles. And, uh, and there was one in, in The Hague when Van Gogh was living there uh, 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 painted by a, a, a member of the Hague School named Mesdai who, uh, of a nearby beach at Skavening that Van Gogh had went to often. And it's still there. You can go see this thing. And basically it's this mural of this seaside uh, town with a kind of cabin in the middle uh, where you can get, uh, uh, you can go into the cabin, look out at the, be uh, the beach. And they actually, and this was originally true in the 18, in the, in the late 19th century when this thing was done, they have sand covering the floor and beach, uh, you know, driftwood and other beach detritus on the floor. It's more than a little kitsch, but uh, Van Gogh loved it. So, you know, I think he would, I don't think he would be uh, offended by the sort of commercial um, um, grandiosity of the whole, of the whole venture. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's my thoughts on it. Speaking of, of um, sort of translating art for screens, mm -hmm. uh, what's it been like seeing your work be and your writing be um, influences for movies, both in, in terms of the Pollock movie and um, Julian Schnabel's movie at Eternity's Gate, which I understand was, was very heavily influenced based on the biography. Uh, and also Loving Vincent too, which was mm. all about the theory of the death which Greg and I uh, right. uh, came up with. And um, uh, Pollock was very special because people won't know this, but Ed Harris's father and my father were roommates in college. And in fact, my father was the best man in his parents' wedding and his father, who was a singer and a performer, sang at my parents' wedding. And it was the father who called Ed up and said, you know, you looked a lot like Jackson Pollock, and Steve's writing a book about him, you ought to consider doing this. And I think it, it was a splendid success. Not only Marcia Gay Harden's Academy Award winning performance, but Ed's st staggering performance. I still can't believe um, Russell Crowe and the Gladiator beat him out for the Academy Award all these years later. But I think he, he managed to take, you know, a, 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 any movie about a, an alcoholic is a hard story to tell in an interesting way. And I think and because the alcoholism is, is central to, Van, to Pollock's life, I think he did a brilliant job. In the case of both Schnabel and uh, uh, Loving Viz Vincent, um, it was fascinating to see you know, how certain parts of the book uh, entered uh, into the visions of these filmmakers. Uh, and I was flattered, obviously, that uh, the people who made Loving Vincent were interested enough in our theory that uh, Van Gogh 
and now I really believe that Van Gogh did not kill himself, uh, um, become the sort of focus of the whole plot. And in Schnabel's case, to sort of accept it as the, as the, uh, as the accurate um, version of the death. Uh, so that was, uh, uh, but, uh, it's also a little hard to know someone. Uh, the, 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 Pollock, uh, the Pollock movie followed the book very, in a very detailed way. So it's remarkably accurate. A lot of the language is directly taken from life. The incidents are very uh, accurate. Both Schnabel's film and uh, Loving Vincent are much more um, um, original in the sense that they took the, the, the bare outlines of the life and made something slight diff slightly different from it. I think the Schnabel, for instance, is, is heavily about Schnabel's own who is a great artist himself, his own view of the natural world and of its influence on artists. And so it's a mixture of Van Gogh and Schnabel. And it's interesting in and of itself. Uh, but if you're if you live the daily life of the person who's being portrayed, it's a little um, uh, uh, it's a little complicated seeing <laughs> somebody else's uh, constructed version of, of, of that person. Right. Yeah, well, and there have been a, f a few questions about about um, Van Gogh's death, which you just mentioned. And of course, you know, you did really a forensic analysis of of um, of how he died and the gunshot wound. Um, did you find it um, difficult to sort of put on a different hat? you know, take off your art historian hat and put on sort of a forensic analysis hat well, too. you know, Greg and I both went to law school. I mean, people may have heard that <laughs> in the introduction and wondered what on earth was this guy doing going to law school? And, uh, but Greg had a great legal mind. And, uh, but one of the things that was wonderful, even on the art history side, is that he was skeptical about everything. So, you know, I sort of was a true believer since I went to, as you did, to graduate school, as well as undergraduate school with lots of art history. And, and so a good example is, uh, uh, Gr Clement Greenberg and Harold Rosenberg, the two most influential critics of the abstract expressionist era, uh, you know, I was, those were the Bible to me. <laughs> Their writings were biblical, practically. Greg reads them and thinks, my God, what were these, do they have any idea what they were saying? Is there anything, <laughs> is there anything real here? And he does, a, he does, a, he sort of takes them apart legally. And uh, it's, it's fascinating to watch. And the same thing true with the death. I mean, uh, I certainly saw, and I think brought to his attention, maybe even the the fact that um, the in, in, in the very short version of this, and it's a very long topic, is that there were lots of questions about him killing himself. You had to have questions. Why did he order paints the day before? Why was why would he take a canvas and an easel out into the fields to make a painting and complete it? And uh, when he's going to shoot himself a few minutes later, it just doesn't make any psychiatric sense. And what happened to the easel? What happened to the painting? Um, uh, I could go on. There, too, there are many other reasons why the story was a little uncomfortable. Um, and then we find out, you know, how did he get a gun? Then we find out that um, uh, two brothers, uh, Rene and Gaston uh, Secretin, who were, I think, 16 and 18 or thereabouts, um, it was their gun because it, 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 because the the younger brother, the survivor, was so irritated by uh, Kirk Douglas's performance in that movie in the Less, in Less for Life that he gave an interview in which he didn't admit shooting uh, Van Gogh, but he admit, admitted torturing him, bullying him, and having the gun. Which which if that had been the whole if that had been everything, I don't think we would have gotten to the point we we got to which there was one additional fact, and that was that John Rewald, who's the greatest, uh, in my opinion, the greatest historian of Impressionism and post-Impressionism, had been at the Sorbonne in Paris in the 1930s um, and would go regularly to Auvers, where Van Gogh died, because other artists were there, lived there too. Uh, Daubigny lived there a lot, uh, Corot visited, Jules Dupre lived nearby, uh, Cezanne had spent a lot of time there. So there were a lot of reasons for him to go. And it was recent enough that the local people knew, many of them knew those people, including Van Gogh. And the, he, uh, the, the constant rumors that he heard in Auvers 
word that Van Gogh had not shot himself, that he had been killed by two young bullies. And um, uh, he claimed not to believe it, but he told everybody. I've asked friends <laughs> of his, and they've confirmed that he told everybody. And I read it first in a, uh, in a book by some medical researcher who had gotten through to Rewald and even in a 15 minute interview <laughs> mentioned it to him. So you take the fact that the people of Aubert who were alive when Van Gogh died, believe it wasn't a suicide. It was a, uh, uh, an accidental homicide basically from these two young bullies. And then you find out that there are the two young bullies and it's their gun. And it explains all of the psychiatric um, and sort of uh, evidentiary problems with the with the suicide theory and uh, so uh, it's, it's it was interesting to see the movies take it as seriously as they did there are a lot of people who spent their whole lives uttering the phrase when van gogh shot himself or putting it in print who've had a hard time coming uh to terms with this new theory um mm -hmm. but uh, you know our feeling was you know we knew that it would overtake the reaction to the book that it was so important and so interesting that people would 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 focus on it, and um, um, but we decided it was too important to not go into, and uh, so there it is for people to, as you say, there's where there's a whole appendix which takes which sort of argues it uh, uh, from the legal point, and after one one person at the Van Gogh Museum, the guy who knew the life the best said. He completely believed our, our version of it. Uh, but there's another guy who's still there who wrote a, 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 a difficult reaction to, uh, a negative reaction to our, our version of the, uh, of the death. And uh, so we responded in Vanity Fair. We, <laughs> we were, the article appeared in, in uh, the Burlington Magazine. They told us to write a response, then they wouldn't print it uh, because they, didn't, they, they were afraid of how the Van Gogh Museum would react. So I, I knew someone at Vanity Fair and asked them if they would like an article. Of course, we had to rewrite it completely because what would be appropriate to the Burlington Magazine is very different from what would appear in Vanity Fair. So we talked to a lot of forensic experts and the top American expert on, in, in uh, homicide versus suicide was even more definitive that Van Gogh could not have killed himself. But based on the finger, the, the hand position that would have been required uh, and based on um, the uh, the absence of smokeless powder and the kind of uh, effect it would have had, and what what the doctors would have seen, but didn't report when they inspected the body. Hmm. Anyway, that's 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 probably enough on that topic. <laughs> well, listen, we're fa we're fast approaching six o'clock, um, but I do want to ask one last question from uh, the Q and A, which is, do you have a personal favorite from the various pieces from your own collection of artists who inspired Van Gogh? In, in, and, in, in, and she adds, we, we have loved seeing some of them in Columbus, Ohio, and are so thankful for your generosity in sharing them. Well, th thank you. Uh, uh, well, there, there are many reasons. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, um, uh, the, the one that is the most meaningful to us was a, a seascape that Van Gogh uh, by Jules Dupre, who was one of the artists most important to Van Gogh. Uh, and, I, and uh, a big admirer of, of uh, um, um, Mie. And uh, Van Gogh saw, if not this painting, all we think it's this painting, one very similar to it in the window at Goupil in, in, um, in The Hague. Because he describes this painting, uh, and our painting was sold by Goupil in The Hague at that time. He describes this painting, which he saw late at night, often he was he had been banned from stepping foot in the family gallery um, and he would saw this painting and he loved the metaphor more metaphorical message which was a lonely boat you know a single sailor in a very dark gloomy um, uh, 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 environment with a choppy sea which represented you know a difficult life with an opening in the clouds towards which the boat is headed which uh, was the, a metaphor for the possibility of happiness. So, you know, uh, it was also an incredible tonalist. It's a, it's a beautiful painting. And there's a, a, a seascape by Van Gogh uh, in Russia um, uh, that, in my opinion, was clearly taken from this uh, uh, Dupre 
um, painting. So, you know, to, to live with a painting that might actually be the one that Van Gogh, because he wrote, a, he loved the painting by Dupre so much that he wrote about it 24 times in his letters, including one very long description. So, um, you know, I think that that one has a particular emotional call. Hmm. Well, thank you so much, Stephen and Stephen. It's been illuminating and fascinating. And I think that everybody needs to run out and buy both books because, you know, how could you just buy one? And I think that the the uh, the new book is just absolutely fabulous. I love it. So um, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, everyone. Our next literary cocktail hour will take place on Friday, February twelfth, at five p.m. with Pacific Northwest winning prize winning fiction writer Jonathan Evison with his new book Small World, which was reviewed in the New York Times this week and has been reviewed in a thousand other publications because it is amazing. Stay safe and stay well, and we will see you next time. Thank you, guys. I really enjoyed it.